welcome to the All Night Society. We're happy to be back in the studio today as opposed to our previous location. While we have most of our bells and whistles back, there are a few we won't be able to use as our recent visitors made an example of some of our equipment and some of the staff. Now, for the news. The CDC has begun an investigation into the source of the measles outbreak we've been reporting on. They say we have an unusually high number of cases. More to come on that in the coming nights. The River Dogs beat Canopolis yesterday 4 to nothing. Go River Dogs. For those who follow the political arena, Democratic presidential candidate Joe Biden will visit South Carolina on Saturday, May 4th, for a campaign stop in the state's capital. Biden, a former senator and vice president to Barack Obama, will campaign in Columbia at the Hyatt Park Community Center on Jackson Avenue. The event starts at 3.30 p.m. And finally, local lottery winner Randall Muskins has been reported to have won $50,000 from the state lottery for a scratch-off ticket valued at $5. When asked to comment, Muskin said, Just lucky, I guess. As we move into our submissions for the evening, I would advise that the content is inappropriate for children, and I would hope that you have them firmly in bed at this tragically late hour. Our first submission is from T.J. Lee. It is titled, The Expressionless. In June of 1972, a woman appeared in Cedar sinai Hospital in nothing but a white gown, covered in blood. Now, this in itself should not be too surprising, as people often have accidents nearby and come to the nearest hospital for medical attention. But there were two things that caused people who saw her to vomit and flee in terror. The first being that she wasn't exactly human. She resembled something close to a mannequin, but had the dexterity and fluidity of a normal human being. Her face was as flawless as a mannequin's, devoid of eyebrows, and smeared in makeup. She had a kitten clenched in between her teeth, her jaws clamped so unnaturally tightly around it to the point where no teeth could be seen. The blood was still squirting out over her gown and onto the floor. She then pulled it out of her mouth, tossed it aside, and collapsed. From the moment she stepped through the entrance to when she was taken to a hospital room and cleaned up before being prepped for sedation, she was completely calm, expressionless, and motionless. The doctor had thought it best to restrain her until the authorities could arrive, but she did not protest. They were unable to get any kind of response from her, and most staff members felt too uncomfortable to look directly at her for more than a few seconds. But the second the staff tried to sedate her, she fought back with extreme force. Two members of the staff holding her down as her body rose up on the bed with that same blank expression. She turned her emotionless eyes towards the male doctor and did something unusual. She smiled. As she did, the female doctor screamed and let go out of shock. In the woman's mouth were not human teeth, but long, sharp spikes, too long for her mouth to close fully without causing any damage. The male doctor stared back at her for a moment before asking, What in the hell are you? She cracked her neck down to her shoulders to observe him still smiling. There was a long pause. Security had been alerted and could be heard coming down the hallway. As he heard them, she darted forward, sinking her teeth into the front of his throat, ripping out his jugular and letting him fall to the floor, gasping for air as he choked on his own blood. She stood up and leaned over him, her face coming dangerously close to his as the life faded from his eyes. She leaned closer and whispered in his ear, I am 
God. The doctor's eyes filled with fear as he watched her calmly walk away to greet the security men. His last ever sight would be watching her feast on them, one by one. The female doctor who survived the incident named her the Expressionless. There was never a sighting of her again. The next story comes from the mind of one of our favorite authors of the genre, Blair Daniels. It is titled, Patient Files. This week, I was supposed to digitize all of Dr. Marnin's patient files. I was feeling good about my progress when I saw it. A filing cabinet hiding behind the shelves that I'd never noticed before. <sighs> Sighing with fatigue, I yanked open the first drawer. I plucked out a file from the section A and began to read. Aberdeen, Carla. All right, Carla, let's see if you're in the system. I set the file on the desk, sat down at the computer, and typed in her name. Nothing came up. Oh, hell no. I am not doing all the files in this cabinet. But I sighed, <sighs> opened a new patient file, and began copying the data. Carla Aberdeen, date of birth, 4. 24, 72, 5 foot, 9 inches, 176 pounds. Finally, I got to the doctor's notes. They were written in messy script as if in a hurry. I put on my glasses and read. Complaints of eczema, itchiness after eating some fruits, lungs may be useful. I stopped and reread that last line. Lungs may be useful. I shrugged, figuring it was some sort of mistake. I typed it into the computer and took the next file from the cabinet, a Mr. David Akowski. But the doctor's notes were even stranger this time. Family history of heart attacks. Large skin surface area. I typed him into the system and stared at the screen. Large skin surface area. What does that even mean? When I got to the next one, a Miss Katerina Allenson, I felt the knot in my stomach tighten. It was a file for a little girl. It read, Night tears ever since sixth birthday. Mom says increased anxiety. Feet are perfect size. I rolled away from the computer, heart pounding. I picked up the file and studied it. There must be an explanation, but I couldn't think of any. I took a deep breath, then I picked up the phone and dialed the number on Katerina's file. But what will I say? I didn't even know. I just had a terrible nagging feeling and wanted to do something about it, but I wasn't in luck. We're sorry. You have reached a number that has been disconnected. What are you doing? I whipped around. Dr. Marnum was standing in the doorway, his arms crossed over his white coat. I was digitizing the files like you told me to, I stuttered, slamming down the phone. Not those files. He violently grabbed the files from the desk and shoved them back into the file cabinet. Then he pulled a small key from his pocket and turned the locks on each drawer. Finish this up, okay? I nodded, and then he was gone. The silence pressed in. The waiting room was empty and still. I checked the clock. 4.45. No more patients would be coming in. It was only Dr. Marnin and me in the office now. So I did what any reasonable person would do. I shut down the computer, grabbed my coat, and started for the door. 
As I hurried towards the exit, I saw Dr. Marnin at the end of the hall. He was opening a door. The door, he told me, went to the supply closet. But beyond him, I could see a set of stairs, snaking down into the darkness. The next morning, I arrived at the office at 6.45 a.m. The halls of the office were dark and silent. I reached for the light. It flickered on above me, white and blinding. I padded down the gray carpet past my usual desk and headed for the supply closet. I took a deep breath and turned the doorknob. Locked. I expected that. I reached into the pocket of my hoodie and pulled out the lock picks and set to work. Within 20 minutes, the door was wide open. I took a hesitant step forward. The wooden step groaned in reply. As I walked further down the stairs, the air grew damp. The stench of chemicals filled my nose. With a smack, my feet hit the floor. The basement was dark. I fumbled for a light switch, but my hands fell on a smooth, cold wall. I reached into my pocket, pulled out my phone, and turned on the flashlight. I froze. Dozens of lights shined back at me, glinting, winking in the darkness. Hello? I called out. I shifted the phone. Each light moved in unison. Oh, reflections. I breathed a sigh of relief. <sighs> Tall shelves stretched the length of the room, creating narrow, shadowy aisles that led to the back. The shelves were stacked with glass bottles of all shapes and sizes, filled with murky liquid. Each one reflected my light, like the multifaceted eye of some gigantic bug. I slipped down the aisle, the silence pressed in, the shadows shifted and flickered with each bouncing step. Finally, after what seemed like forever, I made it to the back of the room. I froze. Standing before me was a gurney. Its metal parts were caked with rust. The mattress was riddled with holes. Little bits of plush filling spilled out onto the floor. It looked like it had been taken or stolen from a hospital decades ago. But that wasn't the worst part. On it was a body covered in a white stained sheet. My heart pounded in my chest. He's keeping a body down here? Terrible images filled my head. Dr. Marnin killing people, stealing from the morgue, botching autopsies, and those notes about the skin, the feet. I need to know. I grabbed the edge of the sheet and yanked it off. A young man stared back at me, his eyes glassy and still. Jagged stitches marred his skin, but in a way that suggested precision rather than accident. They neatly circled his eyes, trailed across his chest, covered his wrists. My eyes trailed down his hips, his scarred legs had no feet. I shrieked and jumped back. There was a loud clang. I whipped around. My foot had collided with a metal rolling tray. On it was a piece of paper, stained and slightly crumpled. I picked it up and began to read. Six foot to six foot four. Large feet. Excellent lung capacity. Blue eyes, if in stop. Rush delivery. And in a little box in the lower right hand corner. Order placed 10 5 2018. The page fluttered to the floor. I don't know how long I stood there, my heart pounding, mind racing. All I know is a deep clang jolted me from my thoughts, along with Dr. Marnin's whistling. 
I took a slow, careful step back. The white beam of a flashlight swept over the room. I cowered behind the shelf, up against the cold glass. Thump. 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 Dr. Marnin's heavy footsteps grew louder. I slipped around into the next aisle, crouching, peering between the jars, watching his large silhouette come into view. His flashlight swept over the shelves, slowly, methodically, as if he was looking for one in particular. The murky liquid inside each was illuminated with bright, penetrating light. Suspended in each one was something dark, misshapen, and terribly human. I let out a whimper. The footsteps stopped. Dr. Marnin whipped around. Hello. His voice was angry, loud. The jars rattled under his volume. I took off running. Hey, get back here. I ran towards the stairs as fast as I could. The wind rushed in my ears. The endless rows of jars flashed by me in the shadows. My feet hit the stairs. I took them two at a time. Dr. Marnin scrambled up after me clumsily. His wheezes echoed off the concrete. I reached the door and ran out into the parking lot. As I peeled onto the road, I didn't look back. And now, the weather. She's nowhere around Traced her footsteps down to the shore Phrase she's gone forevermore I looked at the sea and it seemed the same I took it baby from you away I heard a voice crying in the deep Come join me baby in my endless sleep Why did we fight? Why did I leave her alone tonight? That's why her footsteps ran into the sea. That's why my bed has gone from me. I looked at the sea and it seemed to say, I took your bed from you away. I heard a voice crying in the deep. Come join me, baby, in my endless sleep. Ran in the water, heart full of fear. There in the bridge, I saw her near. Reach for my darling, held her to me. Stole her away from the angry sea. I looked at the sea, and it seemed to say, You took your baby from me away. My heart cried out, she's mine to keep. I saved my baby from an endless sleep, endless sleep. Our final story tonight was given to us by someone who goes by the username of Zana Kitty and is titled The Witch of the Bog. I grew up in my family's modest home on Dewey's Island. My father was quite the drunk before he died. On this particular night when I was about ten, he was more drunk than usual. My mother was also less than useless, 
and had a tendency to use my little brother and I as shields against the old man. To make sure that didn't happen this time, I grabbed my little brother's hand and we ran off into the boggier parts of the island. We headed to our usual hiding spot, which at this time was lined with old, used tires and had a somewhat roof made from an old tarp. It was cozy and warm enough to sleep in if it came to that. Nothing good ever came out of these nights, and in this case the old man noted our absence and decided it was best to drag us back home. The last time this had happened, my little brother wound up in the hospital. I give you all of this information to let you know that I am not easily frightened, having been through a lot in my short life up to that point. As my father's flashlight approached our little shelter, I once again grabbed my brother and we fled deeper into the waterlogged edge of the island. As we reached an area I was certain would lead to the ocean, we spotted a hut. I say hut, because calling a building made of mud and thatch a house doesn't seem to be accurate. The dark of the night seemed to coalesce around this small building, causing it to have the appearance of absorbing the night. As we approached, I prayed it was abandoned. I have never prayed again, and I blame this incident for it. Just as we were within reach of the doorway, a woman stepped into view. I have no other way to describe this woman other than to say she is a bog witch. Her hair was dark and wet. It hung in such a way as to obstruct most of her face and keep it obfuscated from us. Her skin was pale and readily showed veins in several places. She was wearing a dress, old and yellowed with age. It was what was on the dress that gave me instant pause. The bottom of the dress was covered in a dark stain that looked like she had been walking through the mud in the dress for some time. When she appeared, however, I knew the stain was blood. Fresh blood. The coppery smell of it hung thick in the air near her. I instantly started to backpedal. My father would be much safer than this witch. My brother was not so fast in his reversal and slipped. I lost my grip on his tiny hand and he went down into the mud at the witch's feet. Faster than I could follow, she snatched my brother up, holding him high above her head. Sadly, this is where I fail as a sibling and as a human being. I ran. I finished my backpedal and ran for my life back to my father. The brambles tore at my bedclothes and flesh for what seemed like hours before I burst into the clearing with our little tire hut. My father was leaning on the tires and finishing another beer. I screamed that there was a witch in the woods and it had him, my brother. My father seemed to sober instantly when he saw me without him. He ran into the woods searching for my brother and perhaps the witch. After several days, my brother exited the brambles behind our home, dazed. He didn't remember seeing a witch that night, or even going missing for that matter. To this day, no one that I have told this story for has believed that the witch exists. She's out there. I know it. I have been Orpheus. And this has been the All Night Society. Thank you, dear listeners, for tuning in.